Our next speakers are Tom Mellon and Zachary Holder. Uh, Tom is the Remote Sensing Coordinator for the Forest Service Southwest Region. His education includes degrees in forestry from Virginia Tech and North Carolina State and a master's in geography from the University of New Mexico. He has been a qualified IRIN since 2001 and has served as the NIROPS manager since 2009. Zach is the National Fire Imaging IAA program manager for the Forest Service based out of the National Interagency Fire Center. His education includes a degree in forestry from the University of Montana and natural studies at Lees McRae in North Carolina. He has been in fire management since 2003 with a focus on aerial firefighting and situational awareness technology since 2012. Let's get the presenter role transition to Tom. Thanks, Wes. And yeah, as you said, I've been in this position since 2009. My, my day job is as the regional remote sensing coordinator, but through an agreement with fire aviation, um, I've been able to support the NIROPS program as program manager for a little over a decade now. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is kind of a snapshot and some statistics of the, the season, um, and then hand it over to Zach, who's gonna talk about some other IR assets uh, and capabilities that are out there, but I will be focusing just on orders that are placed through the NIROPS uh, website. So 2021, like the previous year, was another long season. It was a little bit different. Um, according to the IMSR from 1029, there were about six and a half million acres burned, a small percentage of that in Alaska, which put us at a little below the 10-year U.S. average, both for the U.S. as a whole and for CONUS, which was uh, different from last year. But what made it such an intense season was the sheer number of fires and the length of that season. Uh, we went to preparedness level four back in June, on June 22nd uh, and hit PL5, the middle of July and stayed there until after the middle of September and didn't finally go back to PL3 until just before the end of September. So that was about roughly 98 days at PL4 and five, which was the most days ever since um, those levels have been instituted. For NIROPS, our first mission was April 26th in Arizona. At that point, none of our contractors had come on and our Forest Service plane was still down. So that mission was actually fulfilled by Aircraft 3, uh, uh, the term for the DOD assets that we can bring to bear sometimes on fires. And what we hope was our last mission was October 30th in California on the, on the Windy Fire. So this graph here shows our requests, both for this year and going back to 2006, which was the year that we started the, uh, the website where we people put in their orders online and we could track them a lot easier. Uh, what you see with the red bar is the total number of orders submitted and the blue bar for each year is the total that were filled. So we kind of smashed through our previous records uh, with just under 4,000 total requests and just over 2,800 filled. Our, our previous high was in 2017 when we had just over 3,000 requests. So those numbers um, obviously then exceeded both our 10-year and our five-year average. Um, the last five years, with the exception of 2019, containing most of our busiest years. So what that left us with, that sheer number of requests, was a 29% UTF rate, unable to fill. but what we really focus on are the non-weather UTFs because uh, the, the strength of thermal IR is its ability to see through smoke to accurately image, you know, where exactly on the ground the fire is burning. Uh, but thermal energy emitted by the fire, the earth cannot penetrate water vapor. So when clouds come in, uh, we can't image the fire and we had a lot of UTFs due to that. So if you remove the UTFs that are due to weather, it actually gets down to a more respectable 16% uh, non-weather UTF rate. And because we had so many contract assets, um, as I'll be talking about a little bit later, we really only had to rely on Aircraft 3, the DOD capabilities for about 1% of the missions. Um, typically, the ones that are either really early in the year before we have other assets on board or geographically isolated, for example, the Greenwood Fire in Minnesota. 
So this is just a look at how the orders came in uh, from June 1st through uh, basically the end of October and comparing the two years, 2020 in green and 2021 in blue. And so you see again, the early start uh, to the season or early in terms of when it got to higher levels of activity and how long it took to trail off compared to 2020, where we never even broke 50 requests a night. And here we had many nights where we were above that. So looking at the fire activity GAC, this chart shows the acres burned in each GAC as a percent of each GAC's 10-year average. And again, these are pulled from the IMSR as of 1029. So there'll be some little adjustment when the final tallies are in, but basically you see the trends that in North Ops, um, almost three times as much acreage burned this season as the 10-year average. And Northern Rockies particularly active as well with twice as much acreage as was normal in the 10-year span. And you see some of that reflected in how our NIROPS orders broke out by GACs, with Northern Rockies having the largest share, over a third of the total orders coming from Northern Rockies with all those fires, that uh, a lot of them that started uh, in early July there. Uh, North Ops, uh, you know, only 14% of the orders, even though they had 300% of their 10-year average burn, because while they didn't have a lot of fires, that, that many fires comparatively, the fires that they did have, like the Dixie, the Caldor uh, Monument, obviously grew to be quite large. Um, and then we saw a lot of orders as well from the Northwest, where both Oregon and Washington were very active. So just an example, this was our busiest night of the year, August 15th, uh, where we were able to uh, fly 48 fires between our Forest Service King Air and our uh, 10X plane, which is one of our exclusive use contract planes, and I'll talk about that more in a second, and two of our end product contractors, Colob Canyon and Oahe Air, that both were able to um, field two planes these nights. And so you see the fires that were covered ranging from Utah to Idaho to Montana, including central Montana, and then all the way Washington, Oregon, and down along the, the stretch of all of California. So I've mentioned these IR mapping contracts. Um, we have two main contracts. The exclusive use contract is with 10X and they supply two planes, two King Airs, and those really function just like our Forest Service planes is in, in that they go out, they can fly very large fires, they can cover a lot of ground, a geographic extent in a given night, they image the fires, they push the imagery off to the FTP site, and our agency interpreters, whether they're federal, state, local, or ADs, they pull that information and produce the products. Then we also have a number of end product contractors that we use quite heavily this year. And the difference there is that they get up, they fly the fires, and then they also produce the products, um, the, the PDFs, the maps, the KMZs, uh, and shapefiles, et cetera. And they do not have the same, not all of the contractors have the same capacity in terms of speed and scan volume. And in general, the end product contractors they cannot cover as large fires or as many fires as our Forest Service and our 10X exclusive use contractors. So we tend to utilize them either to just solely dedicate them to one large fire or a cluster of fires that's in a geographic area, basically within a 500 mile radius. So again, looking at the percents of missions that were flown, uh, we needed everybody. If you look at what we think of as our core capacity, our Forest Service plane. Uh, we only had one this year. Uh, the two exclusive use planes from 10X and then Aircraft 3, that was basically half. I think exactly 49% of all our missions were filled by those, which left the other half to be filled by our different uh, end product contractors, uh, two of which, as I mentioned, had were able to bring two planes uh, to the effort. And this is just the number, and this is just sheer number of missions, not acreages flown. For example, Courtney and Aspen Hilo up there, a lot of, most of the time, each of them was supporting just one, possibly two fires, but a lot of times 
those were some of the largest fires, the ones in California, whether it was the KNP complex or Dixie or Caldor. So looking at the UTF reasons, as I mentioned, almost half of those were due to weather because I don't know if it was people on auto order or, or what, but frequently, even when a cloud bank was coming in, just completely blanketing a GAC, every, every fire that had been put in would continue to put in. Uh, the next major reasons were duty day restrictions or mechanical aircraft, which are really somewhat interchangeable, two sides of the same coin, just basically you have more requests than you have assets to throw at the issue. But a key thing with those UTFs is the prioritization. Um, so we can see here that 37% of the requests came from type two teams, another about order from type one teams, but then a substantial amount uh, came in from type three and other, which is type four and smaller fires, just a little bit from Nemo. And that factors into the UTF rate. So if we look at the non-weather UTF rate for those small fires, it was 27%, so pretty high. 21% for the type three, but when you look at the fires supported by type two and type one teams, uh, it dropped quite a bit because obviously those are prioritized because of values at risk. So some of the key points to remember here, I think for this particular group is the FTP site is gonna be going away at some point. There was a lot of talk prior to this season that we weren't gonna have it for this year. And then eventually when they realized they did not have a suitable substitute for it, um, it stayed up through the season. For next year, it's undetermined. It is a security risk. So there is a constant pressure from the CIO, um, the CIO portions of all the agencies to, to move away from this. And I mention that because that's been a key point, a key place for the, you know, a lot of the SOPLs, the LTANs and F-bands to get our IR products. So you need to be cognizant of that and, and you need to ag advocate for making sure you have access to the data format and tools you need to plug into Wolfdis and FlamMap. On the IRIN side, we have been um, pushed by the uh, NIFSI HOL people to work in the NIFS and get all our data up into the NIFS. And we made great strides toward that this year, but that's a geodatabase environment. So we wanted to just work in geodatabases then. And we immediately very early in the season heard from you all that, hey, we need shape files or KMZs as inputs into these particular packages. So if the, if the National Incident Feature Service is gonna be the repository for all this data, um, you should be asking for tools to export or link up, export data either in a format you need or link directly with Wolfdis and FlamMap. Uh, another point I wanna make is that NIROPS is the best tool for actively growing large fires, for giving you that synoptic look of the entire fire. It is not the best tool for detection, for mop up or very small fires. You know, we had orders coming in for Here's a 20 acre fire we want you to fly. Here's an 80 acre fire. Um, some of those we were able to cover, um, but it's really not the best use of the resource. And keep in mind that IR imagery, it's just a snapshot of heat at the time that the, the plane flies over. We may not be able to map the entire perimeter. This is especially true if the fire started a while ago and has been burning for a while, or there's been a long gap in between IR flights. Um, Bottom line is the interpreters, if they can't put a new perimeter around everything, they just map all the heat they can see in the imagery and somebody else has to go and, and create a perimeter from that. And finally, I wanted to mention that, you know, sometimes we talk about prioritization, but geographic location of the fires is also a big driver of what we're able to cover and not cover. So you may see, hey, this type three fire didn't get covered, but a type four, just a local fire did get covered. And that's more than likely because it was right next to or right in the path between type one and type two fires that are being flown. And it literally was no additional time for the crew to cover that. Whereas to get out to a geographically more separate fire um, would have necessitated dropping some other fires. Um, so we can have some questions later, but at this point I'm ready to hand it over to uh, Zach Holder. Okay, thank you.
So I know we're running short on time for me here. So I just want to be short and quick. Uh, so Zach Holder moved into the National Interagency Fire Center FAM operations as the uh, fire imaging IA program manager. This is previously the uh, Evans Quo position. And I started uh, in that position kind of peak of season, mid-August uh, with a handoff with Billy Gardenia. So the current state beyond NIROPS, there are a variety of capabilities, platforms, and products and distribution methods that you might have run across this year. Um, several of those uh, have kind of been around in some form or factor, but this year to me uh, widely became a, a year that, you know, I'd never seen so much IR uh, over fires. And then, you know, for example, with Dixie, there was almost 24 hour coverage for a long period of time uh, uh, of that fire. And at times you had more aircraft with sensor payloads outside the fire than you did inside the fire part of the firefight. So it was very interesting this year. Um, so what we had, and many of you may have had some experiences with it, we had the, the DRTI RC26 platform. Again, uh, this will be the final, the, the 22 season will be the final season of that um, aircraft due to its service life. The California Air National Guard also supported quite a bit with the MQ-9. Uh, FireGuard is another IR derivative uh, that you'll find in EGP, but it's largely about detection and kind of analyzed fire growth. So I would check that out. That's a growing uh, uh, pilot effort from this year that will continue into next season. It's available in EGP and the IR and Intel TAP. Um, so enhanced aerial supervision, such as Air Attack 5-1, Nightwatch, and the COBRA program, our internal capabilities largely located in Region 5. Uh, Firewatch will continue. That's the fixed wing platform in Southern California. Uh, but the COBRA program has now hit the end of its life cycle. Something similar to that may be available next season, but the primary focus is going to be the HELCO side of that, the aerial supervision side with probably a reduced IR capability. Um, of course, we have the agency UAS, small UAS, and the contracted large DOI UAS platforms. That contract on the DOI side is also um, coming up and may or may not get recompeted. But one of the trends I did see through the year um, was availability of those platforms, and then also the operational impact of needing to segregate. And there, were some, some incidents where an aircraft would crash and, and was no longer available. And of course, we'll have commercial satellites, but uh, still available to us, but there's also many efforts going underway through uh, executive orders um, and some, some legislation, as well as state programs that where you're seeing the DOD get involved in producing uh, near real time products uh, using commercial and classified imagery, uh, DOE, and, uh, and then of course our partners such as CAL FIRE with their fire risk program and extending, or excuse me, Office of Emergency Services, um, flying aircraft, getting intel, but are continuing to expand those type of programs across the state and the availability to federal partners. So mo the, the big trend with all these different assets is you, you may or may not know what you're going to get on any given day. You can put in a request. Uh, largely, these platforms are full motion video, IR, EO. Um, in the everything outside of, of uh, NIROPS, there is a, a large percentage that uh, are in product vendors that may also have other contract line items that do have a, an Overwatch type step stair product. So you get a, a more geospatial ortho rectified image than just a uh, cursor on target snapshot. So a lot of the missions that I was seeing through the daytime is uh, we would get, say, a NIROPS flight and then lots of requests, especially on some of the smaller fires that got UTF'd or the larger fires to go and validate uh, or make the adjustment on the critical flank. Um, and that was a large, large portion of what DRTI was asked to do through their missions. Uh, we also had an in-product contract for uh, detection and you and small fire mapping. Get into a little bit more of that in a minute. 
And then distribution. Uh, distribution is kind of all over the place. Uh, you really have to start hunting and pecking for where to go find something. So we're all pretty well trained to go to the FTP to find the, the NIROS products. Uh, Firewatch, you find them in EGP. DRTI, sometimes they're in EGP. A lot of times it's in an email. Other products are going to various locations of the NIFSI AGL org or being directly streamed, emailed, or texted to the incident. So for this group in particular, it's very hard to track those down as you go through uh, transitions and uh, maybe remote or off-site. So just wanted to show a few trends of, of the demand that we're seeing. This is not all inclusive, but mentioning AirTac 5.1 and Firewatch 5.1, it's the same aircraft, but it's staffed 24 hours a day. They did a total of 384 missions this year, which equated to 856 hours flown. So when you think about that, that's one aircraft with some fairly limited ge geographic coverage. Um, that's a lot of hours to do perimeter mapping and spot fire detection. DRTI, this year we had two aircraft. They flew 183, or excuse me, 130 missions, 134 missions for a total of 524 fl flight hours flown. So through that, they discovered 265 spot fire or new fires and then supported 268 fires. Uh, that and they also had JTACs who were traveling with them. So when they got into a mission profile, they called tactical. We're doing live streaming from the aircraft down to operations, branches, and divisions. Um, and those JTACs supported about 120 shifts, uh, you know, person shifts through the days. Of our end products, um, similar to the NIROP end product contract that Tom mentioned, the uh, they had 124 missions. 92 detections and 32 small fire mapping missions. And that equated to discovering approximately 70 new fires. But uh, as you probably know, there, there's many more pl platforms out there that are not captured in this very quick summary, but it's likely that their total missions mirror that of our assets. So looking ahead, I don't see any changes in the demand and it will continue to grow especially as more resources become available uh, as the trend that I've seen in aviation as uh, the ISR platforms wind down from overseas engagement, then they start looking for other work and become available to us uh, through various contracts. Even if it's an aerial supervision platform, it might show up with a sensor, but a lot of our partner cooperator agencies are also picking those assets up and throwing those into the system. So looking ahead, we definitely want to maintain and enhance our legacy programs such as NIROPS. So there are two new aircraft coming on board for the NIROPS program to help get our WCF fleet back up in shape. And we need to formalize a lot of these ad hoc and pilot efforts that are out there. There's a lot of new missions that are kind of coming on the table. If you recall, Evans was working pretty hard to get a mission matrix uh, formalized so we could define the types of ask and then match those to the appropriate tool and then get standardized products. So I just want to mirror something that Tom had mentioned about you know, needing input from the community to advocate for the, the formats and the types of products that you need. Uh, with me stepping in new to this program area, um, my ears are wide open and I'd, I'd like to hear your input because I, I know that you know it's not all just ICs and it's not just all uh, aerial supervision, that there's, there's a whole team of folks out there that are looking to get leverage these products for different reasons to help with risk mitigation, fire modeling, et cetera. So please reach out to me. Uh, you know, my big goal is to try to find some efficiencies to make sure that we get the right information to the right users in the right time. So we're in early planning uh, right now, trying to gather that solicitation or that feedback and put those into uh, standards so that we can work collaboratively across or so that I can work collaboratively across into the CDNI arena to get the appropriate IT infrastructure up and then also across in the aviation to make sure that we're configured and integrated effectively. So that's my quick little spill. Um, thank you very much. Put my contact information up here. Please reach out to me if you have thoughts or, or definitions of, of products that you need to do your fire support role. Thank you.